We're all set. I call to order uh, public meeting 297 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Um, we will be conducting this through uh, collaboration technology uh, in accordance with an order that Governor Baker issued that gave relief from certain provisions of the open meeting law in order to accommodate protect the health and safety of individuals interested in attending our public meeting. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, I just wanted to, uh, to make a, a, a few remarks. Again, just as a reminder for those who may be joining for the first time in a couple of weeks, uh, the uh, MGC's three casino licensees um, um, operations were temporarily suspended on Saturday, March 14th at 10 a.m. Uh, we extended that order recently to align with the governor's orders, which um, <clears throat> right now will bring the suspension through May 4th. We, we plan to revisit that between now and, and that date. Uh, that decision, again, I, I stated at our last meeting, was made um, after extensive meetings and consideration um, of up-to-date consultation with public health officials, other governmental officials, other large venues, um, and of course with our licensees who like the commission prioritize the health and safety of their employees, their patrons, and of course our employees who work on site on a regular basis, our GEU, our gaming agents, and of course the GameSense advisors. This remains, as I stated, of course, last week, an extraordinarily difficult, sad, and complex time in our global history. And in our work here at the uh, MGC, I think it would be fair to say that the assessment of the public health and economic crisis will remain a minute-by-minute -minute exercise. Today, we'll be addressing what seems to be more like our normal, ordinary course of business. But of course, I think we all take very seriously that it is a fluid, <coughs> fluid um, assessment and evaluation of all our work here at the MGC. For those of you who are observing your religious beliefs this Holy Week, we at the MGC hope you are able to draw new and revived strength through your faith at this time, given the particularly difficult uncertainty. Again, I want to thank all the people on the front line, and I, I know I speak for all of the commissioners and all of the MGC. We thank all the medical professionals. I'm looking across the street, and I have two neighbors who are on the front line at, at um, MGH. We thank our first responders. We ourselves have members of our GEU who are now um, back uh, being uh, deployed by the state police. We thank all the personnel at the grocery stores, at the pharmacies, um, <clears throat> at the convenience stores, all of the delivery people who are working to keep us safe and sound and our families safe and sound. We thank our mailmen and our male women. They are keeping us connected. And we thank the truck drivers and all of those who are getting our supplies, our lifeline across the country into our homes. And again, I have to thank all of the MGC. Many of you are on today. Let me just see. We have 100 participants today on this phone call. Many are members of the MGC staff. We thank you for joining us. We appreciate all the work that you've done to allow us to conduct these meetings. And we thank the public who are attending, including the members of the media, for your interest in our work and the work of our licensees. <clears throat> Moving on, I, I want to note that the first week of April marks very appropriately National Public Health Week. It is a time to recognize in the ordinary course of our business the contributions of public health and highlight issues that are important to improving our nation's health. Since the commission's inception, we built our problem gambling uh, <coughs> prevention and mitigation strategies on a public health model. And credit, of course, Mark Vanderlinden for his good work, um, strengthened, of course, by Teresa Fiore. 
Our partnership with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health is essential to the success of this work, and we work with them on a regular basis. We have them in our thoughts right now as they work right now, very directly to address the impact of the coronavirus. As businesses, including casinos, resume operations, we'll again rely on the guidance and expertise of DPH to address our core mission. There has never been a more critical time to acknowledge the vital role public health plays in our day-to-day -day lives and the extraordinary contribution to our society's greater good. With that, I turn to the business of the day and ask that we um, go to the approval of minutes. Commissioner Stebbins, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. The first set of minutes we have for approval are the minutes from the March 12th, 2020 meeting. Uh, that was an abbreviated meeting, if we all remember. Uh, but those notes were included in your packet, and I would move their uh, approval subject, as always, to any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second the motion. Any edits or comments? Barring none, um, those, in, uh, uh, those in favor? Aye. Well, I guess I should Aye. do it by roll call. Um, we'll do it very quickly. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zunica? Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. There, yes, that's five zero. Thank you so much, and thank you to Shara. Uh, Madam Chair, the next. Uh, uh, group of meeting minutes are from the uh, March 14th, 2020 meeting. That was, again, our first meeting that was held utilizing remote collaboration technology. Um, I would like to, and Madam Chair, I appreciate the additional language you gave me, uh, but add into the, uh, the little gray box, which is always on the front page, uh, just to add on to the end of that, um, language uh, to the effect of in accordance with the governor's order providing limited relief from certain provisions of the open meeting law to protect the health and safety of the public during the global coronavirus pandemic. So we'll be adding, I'd like to suggest we add that to the, the little gray box on the first page, uh, and that will be a regular part of uh, the meeting minutes and uh, in the format going forward. Um, other than that uh, amendment, I would move approval of the minutes from the 314 meeting. Uh, again, always subject to any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Any questions or comments? Do I hear a second? Second. Second. Okay, from Commissioner Zuniga. Barring no comments or edits, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. And Commissioner Stevens. Aye. Chair votes yes, 5-0. Thank you. Moving on. Sure, the next set of minutes is from the March 16th, 2020 meeting. Again, with the, uh, with the edited grade note box on the front page. Uh, I would move the approval of minutes uh, as always subject to any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Any co comments, edits? Barring none, Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Chair votes yes, five zero. Thank you, and, and Commissioner Stebbins, thank you to you and the work that you've done to keep us um, very organized with respect to the use of our recording technology and, of course, Shara's ongoing efforts. Appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. Moving on now to our administrative update, item number three on our agenda. Um, uh, Interim Executive Director Karen Wells will give us uh, department reports. Thank you. Yes, good, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. Uh, despite the temporary closing of the three Massachusetts casinos, a, a significant portion of our normal operations continue, and we have taken the opportunity to focus on some other much needed areas. The MGC is uh, very fortunate to have had a forward-thinking IT department, and we were able to transition to a remote workforce. 
workforce extremely efficiently. Staff has done a remarkable job adjusting to that format. I am extremely impressed with the work output that has continued during this period. I asked staff to provide me with some detail of their current progress. Uh, so I'll, I'll detail some of those highlights for you now so you get a sense of how operations are still continuing. I'll start with the gaming agents division in the IEB. Uh, during the recent shuttering of the casinos in Massachusetts, the gaming agents have been performing uh, some much needed tasks. Uh, some of those include uh, sports betting regulations are being reviewed from other, regula uh, other jurisdictions. To obtain the best foundation for regulations uh, for sports betting for Massachusetts, they've looked at rules and regulations from New York, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Delaware, and they're gonna be looking at others. And they've been working with MGC Legal uh, to touch base uh, with the process just so we are prepared uh, should sports spending legislation go through. Uh, the IEB is, uh, the gaming agents, they're preparing a reopening checklist for the eventual reopening of casino operations. And that checklist is being shared with each individual property and customized for their casino. Uh, each casino's submission of internal controls are also being reviewed against MGC regulations to ensure we have the most robust set of protocols and controls pursuant to 205 CMR 138. Uh, the gaming agents supervisors are paired with gaming agents to review these submissions and then the review is twofold. First is for training and it's also for review of completeness of process at the casino. Uh, Several submission sections are quite large, uh, and these reviews are being coordinated by the senior supervisor for discussion with Bruce and Burke. Uh, our compliance manager, Sterl Carpenter, submitted a vast review with updates for legal review on the gaming equipment regulation of 205 CMR 146. This review helps send uh, some language to the online rules of the game section, which is available to the public. Gaming agents are also holding table games training. Uh, these trains are being recorded, saved in our share drive, and can be used for future training of gaming agents. Uh, we're also, we've implemented the um, LinkedIn learning. So all of the trainings that we're doing now will be able to transition to that platform, which will be our platform for training across the agency going forward. The senior supervisors are in routine communication with the casino, each casino licensee. Uh, there are several point person and department heads the seniors reach out to for updates. So they're in constant communication and they're also in constant communication with their staff, beginning routine HD meetings, et cetera. Agents, uh, agents standard operating procedures are being offered to staff for review and new SOPs are, be, are going to be offered and discussed. So that ongoing process of reviewing what we're doing and making things better and our daily, weekly, and monthly reports are still being completed and submitted. So that team, which is our largest civilian team, uh, is doing a lot of work right now, and they're also preparing for the inevitable reopening of the casinos. As for our licensing division, uh, with respect to Claimridge Park Casino, the staff has completed uh, the qualifier application review and trans transmitted applications to the IEB for investigation. Uh, and they continue uh, to work with the Penn National licensing manager and supplemental application documents. So that renewal process for the Penn National uh, local license is ongoing and the licensing depart the department has done a terrific job with that. Uh, as to vendors, uh, the licensing staff is working by email with primary vendors on their initial and renewal applications. For example, the United States Playing Cards, GLPI, eBet Technologies. So th that process still goes on and they're also working in the same capacity with the secondary vendors. They're also continue to, continuing to work on designation and de-designation of the casino and vendor qualifiers. That's always an ongoing process with new people coming on board at these companies and other people leaving. We have to maintain a current list. So the licensing department has been uh, continuing with that process. We do continue to receive non-gaming vendor initial and renewal applications and the licensing staff will use that for completeness. And if incomplete, they work with the company uh, to get what they need to continue with the process. Uh, they're working by email to process vendor gaming employees, you know, the slot technicians and the system engineers that work at the casino, their initial and renewal applications. 
That's important because when we reopen the casinos, they may have some, some additional slot techs they may need to help with that process. So our licensing team is making sure that can happen. Uh, they're also preparing for the next wave of email notifications to, to vendors whose non-gaming vendor registrations are expiring in July and August of 2020. As for casino employees, they continue to process those casino employee applications through LMS. Uh, they're working with the applicant for application completeness and they queue them up for fingerprinting. As you know, right now we are not fingerprinting just for safety concerns and putting people out with others in the public, but that will resume once the public health officials and governmental officials uh, give the approval. Uh, they're also working on a non for a project with uh, Jill uh, through non-gaming vendor contact information. They compiled a list of registered vendors, uh, approximately 3,000 of those with names, location, address, and email. So that can be used by the Workforce Supplier and Diversity Development Department to help some of those vendors during this time. They're also working on uh, reviewing and editing their standard operating procedures, cleaning up the S drive, cleaning up the licensing share drive, and other uh, matters that can be done, especially while uh, the casinos are closed. So those are just some of the highlights from the licensing department. Uh, as to the IEB, the investigations side of the house, uh, the investigators who continued performing background investigations uh, on all categories of both individual and entity applications. Uh, since the closing in, on March 15th, they have completed dozens of investigations, both at the temporary and the full level. Uh, the investigations actually can continue despite the shutdown. They are using some remote uh, capabilities, so instead of potentially having an in-person communication using these HD meetings or phone call meetings uh, to get the information they need, but they have been able to process uh, the applications and continue with the investigations. Uh, as an example of something we're also doing, one of the financial investigators participated in a virtual tax training session and then she conducted the training for the entire team and they began using new and updated work papers. The PBC renewal license investigation is active. We continue to go along with that. Uh, the state police XO and the enforcement council, council continue to take, uh, have meetings to review applications and place on hold various issues that need attention or action. We're monitoring self-reporting messages for potential licensing action. Uh, we're doing the reimbursement memos, so the, the financial process on the investigative side of the house continues. And, uh, and even our chief enforcement counsel is working on a racing appeal. So we're you know, coming together given uh, the, uh, you know, the tight times we're in, so we're working with the legal department on that. And then we're also working on the exclusion list. I do expect going forward, all these investigations will continue. These vendor investigations are a heavy lift and they take a long time to complete. So this opportunity to really just focus on some of the uh, work that has been in the queue is a great uh, opportunity for the investigators and they're making the most of that. Uh, so that continues to go ahead. There hasn't been much of a slowdown. The only issue on the investigation really is the fingerprinting. So at some point when we have to reopen, uh, we'll need to deal with the fingerprinting issue, but otherwise the work continues despite being remote. Uh, as for state police, uh, as I've said, they're still working on their investigation. So they're not only uh, continuing to work on the individual and entity investigation, but they also maintain a necessary security presence at the casinos. And as the chair mentioned earlier, we also have some members of the GEU have been reassigned to other duties in the department on a TDY basis uh, to aid during the pandemic. So we'll have to do an evaluation of what the um, needs are going forward. We have to work with the state police on what they need right now because they're doing a lot of critical work for the state. Uh, next up is the Ombudsman Office um, for, you know, just like a little uh, a side note, I really would like to thank uh, Mary Thurlow and Joe Delaney for their particular dedication and ability to step up during this time. Uh, they've both been asked to take on more right now and they're just doing an incredible job. So I'm so grateful to both of them and I'm so impressed with the work they've been doing. Uh, the, uh, they continue to work on the 2020 mitigation, Community Mitigation Fund application reviews, which as you know, is, is a lot of work. Uh, and they continue with the ongoing Community Mitigation Fund Administration. Uh, they're working on the Plainage Park relicensing. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on legislative tracking. 
Uh, they're also working on evaluating host and surrounding community payments. And then upcoming items that they have in the queue uh, include the quarterly reports um, and also some meetings like the LCMAC meetings, the GPAC meetings, and they're also working on general compliance. So RFA2, host community, surrounding community, section 61, et cetera. So uh, they're quite the power duo and I'm, I'm very pleased with how that's working out right now. Uh, as for the legal department, uh, also got a lot of uh, work uh, on their plate. Uh, they are also reviewing sports wagering legislation. Uh, they've developed updated racehorse development fund procedures and they're in discussion with committee members. They continue to give guidance on HR matters. They're responding to public records requests. They're coordinating uh, with outside counsel on litigation. Uh, they're pr also participating in the PPC renewal process. And they also uh, have been working, as you know, with uh, preparation of regs describing emergency authority of the commission. Uh, they're working on unclaimed winnings, uh, reg amendments, and promulgation. Uh, as Shara uh, has, is well aware, they're preparing of, of the meeting minutes. Uh, they're coordinating and uh, they're coordinating hearing exclusion list appeals, which are upcoming. They are participating in the community mitigation fund application review. Uh, they're also reviewing our existing contracts. They're advising relative to uh, VSE issues. They're preparing gaming equipment reg updates. They're preparing updates to GLI related regs, including stadium gaming, which is upcoming. And the reviewing of ongoing reporting and compliance requirements. And then there's that racing appeal, which I discussed, which they're coordinating with the Chief Enforcement Council. So, uh, Carrie and Todd are quite busy. They've got a lot going on, so I'd like to compliment them on that as well. I just want to compliment the whole team. Uh, HR continues to move along. Obviously, HR is a uh, tricky issue. We've got people working in different uh, capacities right now. They're working remotely, uh, but their core functions still continue. The timesheet approvals, the payroll changes, the payroll expenditure approval. They're also doing some policy work. Uh, you know, the, they're rolling out um, the uh, employee dining policy that you voted on before. The, they're working on the employee handbook. Uh, also the telework policy, which is gonna be very relevant going forward. Uh, they're also coordinating with both IT and other departments for the training and development, uh, training manual for supervisors. We've got that LinkedIn learning rollout, which I discussed. And they're also working on additional supervisor training sections. We've also got uh, the open enrollment coming up, or that's now in process, so I think it's open right now, so they're working with people on that. Uh, they're dealing with uh, social distraction uh, uh, suggestions, so helping people through the time when we're all in a bit of a crisis. They're putting some proactive things out so that staff has some resources, and they're also conducting those HR office hours. Um, as for racing, it's interesting race. It's, I've talked to um, to Alex and then got an email from her about what they're doing. Now, given the suspension of uh, simulcasting and postponement of racing, for the skeleton staff we have right now, which is similar to what we have during the winter, uh, so they're, but they continue to go along, answering patron calls regarding cash and paramutual tickets, cashing out account wagering accounts, et cetera. They're working with the Department of Agricultural Resources on various items related to breeding programs and health programs. They're participating in virtual meetings with the other associations of racing uh, members and various regulation updates. Uh, they're comparing RCMRs to the model rules of ARCI to see what needs to be updated. Uh, they're communicating with the drug testing laboratory with the federal indictments of 24 people, none from Massachusetts yet associated with racing. There's been a lot to discuss there. Uh, they're looking at the licensing system. Uh, they're looking at the, always looking at the horse uh, development, the race horse development fund and regarding that split. Uh, they're answering questions from horses associations uh, and they're, they're doing a whole host of other things. I'll provide a, a written document for the, uh, for the commission so you can see some of these, but the general uh, workload of the racing department continues in the way that it does in the off season. Uh, they're also going to be, uh, Calculating disbursement and disperse the and dispersing the quarter local quarterly local aid and reviewing and submitting invoices for third party contractors. 
And it's obviously uh, not business as usual for the approximately 18 seasonal staff that we usually hire on. Uh, those back to work dates have been postponed. So there's a lot going on there. Um, I have a very large list uh, from the IT department of things that they're working on. I won't go through that entire list with you just uh, for efficiency purposes. But as you know, uh, we've got infrastructure, uh, network, telecom, and security issues that they're working on. Uh, they're working very hard on client services. So all of us are working remotely. So dealing with uh, folks that are working remotely and what they need uh, has been a priority for the IT department. Uh, so they've been doing a terrific job with that. Um, gaming technical compliance, uh, they're working with uh, the other parts of the agency on um, preparations for potential sports betting legislation, and they are working on several projects, including that LinkedIn learning. So they have been uh, instrumental to our success while the shutdown is going on, and I would like to thank each and every one of them for their time and effort. Uh, We've also got uh, the Workforce Supplier and Diversity Team, Jill and Mitchell, they've been working very hard. Uh, they have done the CARES COVID-19 resources for casino horse racing employees and vendors. Um, so both the casinos and the horse racing employees has, have benefited from that. They're collecting and keeping updated information regarding federal, state, local, and private resources posting on our website and they're planning, planning webinars with MGC grantees who provide virtual small business technical assistance to casino horse racing vendors. Uh, they've been working on the community mitigation fund and that grant review and also grant management and amendments to the 2019 CMF grants. They've also been helping out with Plain Ridge Park Casino relicensing. So just give me a minute, <laughs> we've done a lot. So uh, Responsible Gaming and Research, they're um, continuing to move uh, with some of their projects. Uh, they have a plan with external stakeholders to collect player card data. Uh, they're, they're in regular contact with contractors, especially Sigma and MCCG to discuss and plan for changes in scope and budget. They've made changes to the VSE process to allow for remote enrollment. Uh, they're planning a responsible gaming and problem gaming training series, including a VSC refresher training for all gaming agents. So they're involved with the internal workings of the agency as well. And then going ahead, uh, they're mitigating the voluntary self-exclusion database, uh, they're migrating, pardon me, migrating the voluntary self-exclusion database to a new platform. They have major updates to the NGC research page, and they're drafting guidelines for online gaming. Uh, our finance team continues to do a lot of work, especially right now. I can't uh, begin to tell you how many hours Derek Lennon has put in over the last few weeks and how busy his schedule is. And he's really got a great team supporting him on those efforts. They continue to work on the budget. Um, uh, their budget updates, monthly meetings with directors on their budget and cost estimates, processing of invoices through a remote system, reviewing vendor spend and matching there's path flow timing and estimates, uh, working on that 20, uh, FY21 budget development, coding the expenditures and donations for the COVID-19 requirements, um, and also reviewing and updating policies and procedures. They also continue to work along uh, on the revenue side of the house. I won't get into all those details, but I have several bullet points I'll provide with the, with, for the commission. Uh, and then last and not least, uh, the communications department. And the communications department is really supporting the other divisions with identifying impactful ways to share important information with our constituents and, and stakeholders. Uh, for example, the comms office has been working with uh, workforce development. As I said, they have related, uh, worked on related uh, uh, identification of various resources for local casino vendors, casino and racing workers, and those who are struggling with problem gambling. The communications office is also keeping media informed about all commission related developments, maintaining our dedicated COVID alert webpage on massgaming.com and keeping our social channels updated. So I realize that's a lot. I have a lot more detail which I'll provide to all the commissioners, but I think it's important that you understand that there's a lot within each division. And if the commissioners want specific updates on a, a particular division, similar to what we've been doing in public meetings, uh, in the past, 
please let me know and I can highlight uh, any, any further work that that division is doing and I can have that particular director report to the commission. So again, I wanna thank the staff for their work during this time. Uh, we expect to be gearing up to reopen the casinos uh, once the public health and governmental officials give the word. Expect, that's expected to be a heavy lift in a compressed time frame. but with all the work that is going on right now, the staff is going to be ready. So I would like to compliment them for that. So that's the long-winded narrative on a lot of things that are going on at the commission right now, just so you are aware, because I realize it's a little different when you are remote and you don't see us in the office every day and can see what's going on. I wanted to give you a, a fulsome explanation of all the things that are going on remotely. So that's my, that's my very long narrative. <laughs> And, and gonna, Commissioner Cameron, go right ahead. Thank yeah, no, I, I just, that was very impressive. And um, I certainly learned a lot from, um, about what each group, I'm not surprised, but I am grateful. And um, just, I know what kind of team we have. So uh, Interim Director Wells, please thank the team. And it's much, much appreciated. I will, thank you. Other commissioners, Commissioner Ryan. No, um, thank you, Karen. I had some contact with the legal department in particular, working on some of what you're talking about. It's good to hear about um, in detail what some of the other groups are doing that I haven't had a chance to connect with. So um, I would hope to reach out individually, but also to say to all of them, thank you very much for the work that you're continuing to do. Commissioner Stebbins or Sunika. Go ahead, Enrique. Um, well, yeah, thank you. Um, no, this is this is a very good uh, summary that uh, there's there's a clear theme here, uh, and that is that a lot of the work that uh, continues for many reasons, um, you know, litigation, public records, um, community mitigation, finance, the bills don't wait. Uh, even even having to wait for to pay a bill requires work. So a lot of people do a lot of um, necessary work and that's a very good um good summary um uh, karen um, i'm also uh, very encouraged by um our ability to go back into what was perhaps a backlog of or pending projects um uh, you know the, the cleaning out uh, hard drives and uh, maybe some proactive work about uh, sports betting research and regulations it's also really um you know good good to hear about I don't want to go through the list necessarily, but um, I just want to make uh, uh, you know a, a general point here that I know is is, um, is uh, operating, but uh, it, it should go without saying. Um, to the to the extent that we deal with uh, external stakeholders that have gone themselves to a you know diminished workforce for for reasons uh, uh, you know given their circumstances. Um, I know we, we have to be flexible in terms of what we require in response times for uh, as they um, you know, themselves uh, look at uh, uh, an ongoing, on, ongoing priorities. Um, so there's, there's that theme of flexibility that I know uh, we're all reasonable and we'll be con continuously thinking about. Um, as well as uh, streamlining where possible uh, and, and, and uh, taking um, uh, processes out of this uh, period that might put us in a best in a, in a good position as we, as we all emerge from this uh, from this uh, closure period I think, I think there's a um, there's there's a, a realization that like uh, prior uh, like the prior great recession um, the licensees will probably take some time to ramp up um, to um, you know, uh, to what was a normal uh, a period prior to this closure, and it's something that we also need to be uh, thinking about. As I know, uh, some of you already already are. So um, overall, really good um, good update, and and um, I just want to leave with the, with the message of having to be um, very proactive and and and, and flexibility. Uh, as we continue with these very um, challenging times. 
Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I would I would echo the the comments of my colleagues. Uh, I've had a chance to continue to work with a number of departments, including uh, Joe and Mary on the community mitigation fund, and of course Jill and, and Crystal and the great work they're continuing to do, uh, reaching out to many of the small businesses that are being impacted. Uh, but kudos to to Karen and the rest of the team. Um, I like. Uh, the fact that they're taking advantage of this suspension period, as it's been pointed out, to relook at regulations, relook at uh, rules of the game, uh, internal controls, uh, as well as you know, preparing ourselves uh, with a review of how other jurisdictions have handled sports betting. Uh, Commissioner Zuniga and uh, Director Lennon and I were on a a uh, conference call the other day that included some of our uh, re UMass research partners talking about um, obviously the, the gaming market overall in the Northeast, uh, as well as uh, what might be expected as uh, the industry comes out of the current uh, closure that it's facing. Um, and some, uh, some words of wisdom to not rush into things, uh, that might be a, a, a short-term solution, but might not be best for the long-term. So uh, I appreciate everybody's work that they're doing to kind of uh, do some homework at this time on some of the critical issues. Uh, thank you. In fact, um, Commissioner Stubbins, I know that um, our communications director, Elaine Driscoll, was on that um, webinar, as, as was I. So other, other folks may have been joining. I think uh, that was a very helpful presentation and great to have um, one of our uh, research colleagues uh, be um, <clears throat> really uh, take the lead on the discussion. With respect to sports betting, I think Karen made it very clear there's no presumptions here. The legislature is still very much contemplating the potential for legalizing sports betting here in Massachusetts. With that said, um, the draft legislation, uh, uh, the early drafts in the most current draft um, did. Uh, designate us to be the regulator and we have promised the legislature that in the event we are asked to regulate we will um, we will be prepared and poised and given that there is so much uncertainty we want to make sure every tool um, available is available to the legislature that they might um, want to look at and so um, going forward not only has as Karen points out there's been some considerable thought um, in, the, in these last Few weeks while we've um, had suspended operations uh, to sports betting, we um, will be uh, organizing that effort in a structured way. Um, uh, Commissioner Cameron and I will work with the uh, very long list of critical um, uh, uh, director level um, individuals, knowing of course that with each of them comes their entire group. Uh, this will be something, if it is legalized, that will take an enterprise-wide effort and could equally be um, something that's urgently looked at. Again, we have, while we are mentioning sports betting, let's all remember the legislature has a lot on its hands right now and it may be very much removed from their thinking. But again, as promised, we stand ready and we will use the resources of um, our team in a, in a judicious fashion. Uh, Con taking into consideration Commissioner Zuniga's important point that we don't want to impose on external um, individuals or um, enterprises in a way that taxes them unnecessarily at this time too. So all, all good, but Karen, uh, I know that I had very much wanted that update and whether it's gonna come in today's format at our meeting or, or through um, an email. And I, I wanted it because I, have been quite aware of all the efforts that have been going on and but I wasn't aware truly and yeah. so detail today really really um, made me uh, only more appreciative so thank you so now moving on to our our um, our, our um, one of the two I don't know if Mary will be contributing or not to um, 3b of our agenda but we did Ask Joe Delaney to uh, to bring us up to date on a um, legislative activities report, and then of course Jill Griffin because of her good work as the director of workforce supply 
our supplier and diversity development, she'll be joining on this update. So thank you, Joe and Jill. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Um, so I'm here today with Jill Griffin to provide a uh, legislative update uh, regarding the current pandemic. Uh, we are closely monitoring the various federal and state bills that have been filed with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in Massachusetts alone, 80 bills have been filed related to COVID-19, uh, most of which are currently working their way through the legislative process. Uh, at the federal level, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, which is known as the CARES Act, which I'm sure you've all heard about, uh, was recently enacted, and that's the main topic of our discussion today. So the CARES Act provides needed resources for the COVID-19 public health response. It's a $2.2 trillion package, uh, which is the largest economic relief package in U.S. history. Um, now, while the CARES Act provides relief for many people and industries, um, this discussion for the Commission just focuses at a very high level on the portions of the Act that are most relevant to the Commission, to employees at the casinos, to our licensees, and to our vendors. So I will focus uh, on the impacts of the CARES Act on individuals and on the mid-size and large businesses while Jill will discuss the uh, relief provisions to small businesses, particularly uh, the Paytech, Paycheck Protection Act uh, program. So with respect to individuals, uh, probably one of the biggest pieces of this is the enhanced unemployment benefits. Uh, the CARES Act expands existing unemployment insurance in two ways. Uh, first, by providing an extra $600 weekly payment for all weeks of unemployment between April 5th and July 31st, and second, by extending unemployment benefits for an additional 13 weeks. So in Massachusetts, currently, uh, the maximum unemployment benefit is $742 per week for a maximum of 30 weeks. Uh, so these provisions would increase the maximum to $1,342 per week with, while extending the benefits out to a maximum of 43 weeks. Uh, the Act also expands eligibility for unemployment insurance to individuals who are, who are self-employed, who are independent contractors, or who have a uh, limited work history, uh, among a few other um, uh, expansions. Uh, Governor Baker has signed a bill waiving the one-week waiting period for unemployment benefits, which was uh, requested as part of the CARES Act. Uh, the second major uh, benefit to individuals, of course, is the, uh, the payments to individuals. So uh, individuals who earn less than $75,000 per year or couples that earn less than $150,000 per year will each get $1,200 plus $500 for each child under 17. Um, these amounts are reduced for people with higher incomes and are eliminated for individuals with $99,000 in earnings or more, or couples with $198,000 in earnings. And the last major piece for, with respect to individuals is the extension of tax filing. Uh, the filing date for federal income taxes uh, under the CARES Act has been extended to July 15th, and Massachusetts has also extended the state filing date uh, for state returns to July 15th as well uh, to be consistent with the federal act. Um, with respect to mid-size and large businesses, um, you know, the gaming industry is eligible to participate in this program under, under the various federal programs that are established in the Act. Um, you know, many of these provisions are very complicated, and it's not really my intention here to get too deep into the details, but I just wanted to present a high-level overview of some of the programs that may potentially be available to our licensees and or vendors. Um, the first item is financial assistance. Um, the CARES Act sets aside $454 billion in financial assistance to those firms that are not eligible for the small business loans under the, the Paycheck Protection Program that Joe will discuss in a couple of minutes. Um, for medium-sized firms, those, which are those that are uh, between 500 employees and 10,000 employees, Loans will be made available at an interest rate of not more than 
and will not be due and payable for at least six months after the loan is made. Um, for larger businesses, uh, loan guarantees, loans, guarantees, and other investments will be at a rate determined by the Treasury Secretary. Now, for both of these programs, for the larger businesses, there's no loan forgiveness, um, and there are significant conditions that must be met to obtain these loans. Um, and my understanding is at this point in time, not a whole lot of guidance has come out on these the particulars of these programs, but that should be coming from the Federal Reserve and the Treasury uh, shortly. Um, the other big provision uh, is tax relief. There are a whole host of tax provisions that will provide these medium and large businesses with some financial relief. Uh, some of these include deferral of social security tax payments, uh, advancement of depreciation costs, employee tax credits, and um, other, uh, shall we say, more esoteric provisions that uh, I'm not going to even pretend that I understand. Um, so those are the main uh, provisions for medium and large size firms. And with that, um, I'll either open up to questions uh, from the commissioners on these provisions, or I can just turn it straight over to Jill to discuss the programs for small businesses. Good morning, commissioners. Oh, uh, uh, good morning. Can I just check in on commissioners? Did you have questions for Joe or do you want to wait till you hear from Jill perhaps? Okay, I don't hear any. So we'll continue with Jill and then perhaps the, the, the combined presentation may prompt some questions. But Joe, thank you very much. Very clear for me. Thank you. Jill. So there, there are actually two programs that I think might be of interest to our um, casino and horse racing vendors. The first is the Paycheck Protection Program that Joe mentioned, um, administered by the US um, Small Business Administration. And 349 billion has been provided for small businesses through this program. Um, companies with up to 500 employees are eligible. And um, companies can borrow up to $10 million. And the unique, um, uh, the unique thing about this program is that it provides forgiveness of up to eight weeks of employee payroll. Um, the loans are acquired directly through banks and are 100% federally guaranteed. Um, um, as Joe mentioned, um, um, demand for these loans has been extraordinary, um, as you can imagine. Um, some issues have, have been identified in terms of um, difficulty applying for the loans and lack of guidance and that sort of thing. Um, the SBA advises businesses to apply for this loan through their existing bank. Um, and um, they can also get guidance through the um, small business development centers that are um, in existence across the state. The second um, um, is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Advance Program. And um, small business owners, again, um, that have up to 500 employees are um, eligible for a disaster loan advance of up, of, um, up to $10,000. Um, and this provides immediate relief and um, apparently there's a very fast turnaround time. Um, the loan advance will not have to be repay, repaid. Um, and um, in talking with Director Lightbound, um, many horse racing vendors are independent contractors, so this program may be of particular interest to them. Um, they, um, it's open to independent contractors, uh, nonprofits, small businesses, um, and so um, I think that would be of particular interest to some of the smaller firms. Information on both these programs can be found directly on the SBA website at sba.gov. Um, 
we, as has been mentioned, have been also posting helpful information regarding the CARES Act and other state and private resources on MGC's website as well. Um, massgaming.com backslash COVID-19. Um, so, and, and I just wanted to mention as well, um, in order to help um, casino vendors and other small businesses that um, we work with to access these funds, we actually have two small business technical assistance firms um, that we engage actually well before this crisis but they have pivoted and, and are providing valuable information about some of these funds and how to access this. Um, um, in addition, um, one of our vendors, um, LEAF, a, a community development um, corporation, is working with us regarding a webinar that will take place on Tuesday, April 14th. We'll be um, providing more details about that um, webinar as well, so. Thank you. I do have a question. Um, I'll get it started in case, uh, in case uh, no one else has any questions. For a small business, um, <clears throat> just to clarify, unemployment versus the uh, Paycheck uh, Protection Program, if I furlough, um, employees, which means they stay kind of in my system, haven't terminated them, they're eligible for unemployment, correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, but that would not cover benefits, correct? But, and, and so my next question, if this is helpful, the program, the paycheck protection payroll, can you use that loan for not only salary, but for benefits too? Can that be part of the calculation? Because paycheck is a little misleading to me, but I would assume that means benefits so that if I employ five employees, I can go to my lender and, and, and ask for the amount and then apply it to not only a salary, but also the fringe benefits. Yeah, I think um, if my reading of that is correct, there's there are provisions. You can use it to pay rent. You can use the loan to, to, yeah. to pay a whole host of different um, costs. I think that in order for the uh, loan to be forgivable, right. a certain percentage of it, and I can't remember the exact amount, it might be 75%, 80 maybe. Um, has to go towards payroll. Oh, okay. So I imagine the other parts can be used, could be used for, uh, you know, benefits and, and things right. of that nature. Certainly, you know, I said uh, rent and, and utilities and other things are eligible. And you have to make a commitment to retain the, those employees after the crisis. Or yeah, well, when you get to the end of the eight-week period, as long as you have maintained your employment at a certain level, I would think 80%, then the loan is forgivable. If you don't do that, then it's just a loan and you have to pay it back. You have to pay it back. Okay, that's really helpful. Uh, so there is a distinction because some people might think, well, what is the difference between unemployment and, and the, the very generous unemployment? Why would you do that and maybe furrow versus the, the, um, the small business loan? Uh, because there, you can use the small business loan for a variety of not just salary. Well, and I, and I think that the notion of the small business loan is to encourage employers to keep employees on the job. On the job, exactly. To continue to pay them as employees so that they don't have to go on, on unemployment insurance. That's right. Which, which helps uh, that program stay more solvent. That's right. And the unemployment insurance gives you a couple of options if a company is not able to keep their employees um, or keep paying full time, um, they can access the work share program um, through our Commonwealth's um, um, Department of Labor and Workforce Development. Um, and so they might pay partial wages and, and partial unemployment. So That's really helpful too. And you've been given guidance on that too. I know um, the various uh, vendors. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great program. 
Any further questions that help clarify my mind? No. Okay, very helpful, and, and we'll stay tuned. I know that as the state continues to look at um, its agenda, we'll we'll receive more and more updates that are that are localized. So thank you, and thank you, Joe and and Jill, and I know Mary will be supporting your efforts as well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Great, nicely done. So we're moving on now to item number four, the accounting and finance um, report that will be led by the Chief Financial and Accounting Officer, Derek um, Lennon. I wanna just point out that today's discussion is keeping really with our standard quarterly review process combined with, as we understand, a profound awareness that, in our, <clears throat> that our agency and the state, state's gaming industry along with so many around the world are now facing an unprecedented, and as I commented earlier, dynamic situation. And given the rapid, <clears throat> rapidly evolving circumstances resulting from the wide ranging impacts of COVID-19, um, Derek Lennon has urged the commission to proceed as scheduled with a budget review as a prudent step and an appropriate action, particularly in light of emerging fiscal considerations. It is not, in other words, business as usual. In fact, I anticipate, like many organizations, that we will be revisiting budget discussions on a regular routine basis as the landscape continues to evolve, facts develop, and as financial impacts become clearer to view. So thank you. Um, and, and, and as Karen noted, Derek and his team have been extraordinarily generous in, in, um, in, in uh, with us as commissioners and in informing us and briefing us and, and helping us to understand the details. I wanna applaud Commissioner Zuniga for his patience with me as I asked, I think only 100,000 questions. So um, all, all very helpful to me and I'm sure that I speak for the other commissioners who have done the same. So thank you, Derek, do you wanna get started? Yes, can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Good. good morning. And Derek, good morning, Madam Chair. Yes. Yeah, and you'll introduce your team too. And, and Commissioner Zunica will be joining your presentation. Absolutely. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. I, I am remotely joined by Agnes Bollier, the um, Chairman and Accounts Payable Manager, as well as Doug O'Donnell, our Revenue Manager, and Commissioner Zuniga. Um, we're here to present to you the second and third quarterly budget updates for the Mass Gaming Commission. Before we do the presentation, uh, I just wanna point out that I found an error in one of my formulas on page four of the memorandum. Um, and let me see if I can share the memorandum. <clears throat> That's shared right now? Now there it is. is. Yeah, there it is. Yes, thank you. Okay. Let me move this over and just make sure I'm still sharing. I'm still sharing the memorandum, correct? Yes, you are. Okay. So if we go down to page four of the memorandum, and if you look at um, the chart titled January 1, 2020 gaming positions, the numbers under the slots and table gaming positions are correct but the total didn't pull through this is the actual old numbers so nice. these numbers went down by about 700 gaming positions which would change these percentages um, now i want to emphasize that doesn't change the remaining assessment no. it does not change the um, projected surplus that i cover in the memo all it does is change the distribution of that remaining assessment, um, which I'll have to work out with the licensees Doug and I will have to do. So I wanted to point that out because if anyone actually pulled out a calculator and didn't rely on Excel to um, do the totals like I was relying on, um, you would see that these numbers didn't add up. So I apologize for that. I will get a revised one in the, in the final package for what we post onto the website for historical purposes. And if I can interject for one second, that was um, a formula that I had sent over to Derek that uh, didn't calculate correctly, but the percentages did change uh, on a minimal basis. For MGM, it goes down to 30.19, where currently it's 32.57. Um, Encore goes 
to 54.02 and Penn goes to 15.77. So those are the actual percentages that there'll be. And, you know, I, I know Doug's taken the, taken the bullet for that, but I, I should have checked those formulas ahead of time. And, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of stuff that went into this. And um, um, I guess there could have been a lot worse places. We had, we had some calculation errors. Um, we've checked all the other numbers. Those are correct. Just wanted to point that out before we progress. Thank you. Um, so so moving on. Yeah. All right. So moving on, the commission approved a FY20 budget for the gaming control fund of 34.2 million, which is composed of 28.4 million in regulatory costs, 5.78 million in statutorily required costs, as well as um, for the first time, the entire research and responsible gaming budget was funded from the public health trust fund. Um, the first quarterly update for the gaming control fund um, required an assessment of 28.39 million on licensees. And they were also assessed an additional 5 million for the public health trust fund, resulting in a total assessment of $33.9 million on our licensees. Just wanted to remind the commission the approved FY20 budget did not include funding for the additional ongoing litigation. Um, we put that at the bare minimum required for our um, insurance. It also had a built-in deficiency for public safety overtime costs. We discussed that at the first quarterly update. Um, for this review, and mainly as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, staff has worked to review the previously identified deficiencies, as well as any additional areas where the MDC could reduce spending without impacting core services. We've also reviewed revenue and made assumptions in the worst case scenario where the revenue received as of the end of March would be final revenues for fiscal year 2020. With that backdrop, I'll now get into the updates for the second and third quarters. Through the first six months of FY20, the Gaming Enforcement Unit spent approximately 90% of the $1.25 million overtime budget. Once again, a reminder, they had requested more. We went with a truly um, optimistic number that just didn't come out to um, be what we were hoping for. However, their straight time had underspent during that same time period by about 225,000, which is one of the reasons you saw the overtime go up. Um, an additional 600,000 for overtime, overtime would have been a realistic target to complete the fiscal year. And once again, that would have been under normal circumstances after reviewing the first six months. Additionally, the litigation budget was entirely spent in the first six months of the year. We were recommending an increase for that budget by 560,000 to complete litigation matters for the year prior to the shutdown. Um, to cover the exposures at the mid-year uh, period, the MGC experienced some attrition, which laid to which we um, which turned into 600,000 in payroll savings, as well as another 228,000 in fringe in payroll taxes, and we had targeted approximately 250 re 250,000 reduction in the Attorney General's office spending. Um, because at that point, they were 50%, they were well below the 50% spending mark, and they continue to be, even at the 75% of the year mark, below the 50% spending mark. Um, so we think that that is a very um, small target and easily achievable. So at that point, we were in balance um, as, of, as of the mid-year with those, with those assumptions. But that brought us to the third quarter. Um, and on March 14th, the commission, with the cooperation of our licensees, unanimously voted to suspend, suspend gaming operations in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Through a series of emergency orders from Governor Baker, which were issued on March 15th, March 17th, and the 23rd, the emergency closures for casinos has been extended until May 4th. And to the, in response to this changing environment, we prepared a series of recommendations for targeted reductions based on sound, fiscal policy and focused on stopping projects that are the natural stop point, not beginning projects that do not have the necessary avail available resources to start, and reducing budgets where spending most likely cannot happen. The easiest place for that is travel, conferences, and parking. Those are easy examples of where it just can't happen. We're not there. Um, the total amounts of spending reductions identified are summarized on page two of the memorandum. Let me get down to that. 
in total approximately 1.5 million. The details of these can be found in attachment C um, under the third quarter uh, spending reductions. The second part of our review was to look at a worst case. Derek, could we, just, could we pause for just a second? Um, I wanna just give the opportunity uh, to the commissioners. Do you, would you like to ask questions along the way or do you want to wait until, if, if you want to ask questions now, um, I can't see everybody. So you'll have to actually, you know, say something to me. Otherwise we'll wait to the conclusion. I'm not hearing, everybody's all set to wait then. All right, I see Commissioner Cameron and Commissioner Zuniga on the screen, and I assume then Commissioner Stebbins and O'Brien, you're also set. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Derek. It just seemed a natural place because you've gotten to the 1.5. Thank you. My pleasure. The second part of our review was to look at a worst case revenue scenario for the rest of uh, fiscal year 20. Licensing revenues through March. So. The worst case scenario was actually turned out to be a pretty decent revenue um, discussion. Um, licensing revenues through March have already exceeded initial projections by 220,000. Um, as we have discussed in previous meetings, um, additional security costs that have been requested by Encore Boston Harbor for the gaming enforcement unit have been billed back directly to them, resulting in 118,500. Um, that was not part of our initial projections. Um, and in addition, the MGC received final payments related to the wind suitability from last year, as well as we've received 220,000 in vendor primary billings in excess of the initial fees. Um, reminder, we work on a modified cash basis of accounting. So while those events may have happened in previous fiscal years, we realize the revenue when it's received. Um, the combined impact of the decrease in spending and increase of revenues results in a projected surplus of $2.15 million in the Game and Control Fund. Tool 5 CMR 121 describes how the Commission assesses its operational costs on casino licensees, including any increases or de decreases that are a result of over or underspending. As of today, the Commission has billed for the entire assessment to licensees, not reflecting any of the proposed changes to the assessment included in page four of the packet. That being said, on March 26, 2020, MGC staff conducted a call with the three casino licensees. This, co this call covered many topics regarding the budget, but one of the main points I'd like to bring back here for consideration was the request for timing of payments. The licensees requested that the last quarterly allotment be spread out over monthly installments to assist with their cash flow while they're generating no revenue at their facilities. 205 CMR 121 provides sole discretion to the commission to approve or deny any budget recommendations from staff, as well as, schedule for, as, well as set the schedule for the timing of payment of any assessments. Given the information provided today, um, the commission has multiple options on how to proceed, and I'll get down to that, that section there. Um, I laid out many of them on page five um, regarding spending and revenue options, whether we take all of the um, recommendations, whether we take a piece of them, um, and then use some of that surplus for other initiatives, uh, whether we accept it all, and then the commission asks us to go back and cut deeper. Um, or you know, accept them and then say, keep looking for some cuts where you see it or where spending isn't actually coming through. Um, under the assessment, um, we have options of whether we can credit the full amount to the uh, licensees and then bill it all at once, revise our quarterly billing or spread it out over the three months as requested, um, continue billing for the full amount or any revised amount in between there. Um, once again, bill that all at once and ask it for, for a full assessment, we're billing out over three full installments. Um, there was a request regarding the Public Health Trust Fund, whether we could defer payment to that, um, whether we could um, string that out over three months as well, like the other um, piece. Um, and you know, we have some pretty basic options there because the statute requires us to bill that um, by at five million on a floor on an annual basis once we begin. And since this is the first year, we actually 
shifted it over to the Public Health Trust Fund, I probably would never recommend that you guys defer that payment until um, after the fiscal year. So that, that gets me to my recommendation. And once again, this is just mine, doesn't represent any, anyone else, um, but I'm recommending that we accept all spending recommendations and revenue adjustments, which would re uh, result in a $2.15 million surplus. We continue as staff looking for budget adjustments throughout the next few months. So if we find areas that um, we either go up or down, we bring that back to the commission in a timely fashion. Um, I'm recommending we credit the surplus to the 2020 Game and Control Fund licensee assessment and adjust the final quarterly billing for the Game and Control Fund to be billed over three equal installments on a monthly basis. And then we continue to assess for the Public Health Trust Fund on a monthly basis rather than all up front. My opinion that this balances the difficulty licensees are experiencing regarding cash flow but also ensures they are compliant with their obligations under 205 CMR, CMR, CMR 121, which is to pay both the annual operating costs of the Game and Control Fund, as well as the statutorily required minimum assessment of 5 million for the Public Health Trust Fund. At this point, I just wanna say thank you to um, Doug, Agnes, the whole team um, in finance, Jacqueline for putting up with me. Um, I want to thank Enrique for all the work he has done, all the commissioners for the time that you have spent looking at this with me um, um, and bringing different points of view to me. Um, I want to thank every single director and their staff at the MGC who have taken this exercise head on and really identified deeper than I could ever imagine. If you look at a $7 million assessment remaining for the last quarter of the year and coming up with you know 1.5 million in cuts that's pretty significant you know and that's that's really identifying and that's not cutting our core service areas that's just saying hey i can stop this project here i have a natural breaking off point or hey we had conferences scheduled we're not going to go to them um so I'm, I'm really impressed with the work that went into this and at that point i'll uh, mute myself and turn over to any questions Commissioner Zuniga, before we have questions, do you want to add? Yeah, no, I, um, oops, I, I lost, um, I lost you, hold on, here we go. Uh, no, very, very, um, very good memo. Um, I, uh, I agree with, um, with uh, all the recommendations with one small caveat that I'll talk to in a minute. I think we should discuss them um, individually. Uh, but overall, uh, I think um, it's 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 very important that, that the work that is being that is taking place here, which is to really think critically about what um, has changed given all these circumstances and what we can do to be responsive to the reality of um, a, 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 a shutdown of revenues for licensees um, and how we need to react to the extent that we that we can. Um, I think there are, um, and let me mention just one thing here. I, I know you mentioned it. Um, you were not, I'm not taking you literal, literally, um, uh, Chair, um, asking as many questions as necessary here is really critical. It is five, the five of us commissioners who need to both understand and agree and make decisions ultimately in this period of um, changing environments. And um, one thing that I, uh, I think operates in, in this assessment, it's a principle of assessing necessary costs. Um, they will pay them and they, uh, they are looking, these, these licensees are looking at cash, uh, at, the, at their cash positions, and they have uh, different circumstances and different approaches. And, understanding that is gonna be also very important, especially if these closure, uh, closures continue. So I think um, as we, uh, as, as the memo currently stands, uh, is, is very prudent. It's, um, uh, it's the work of, of the Derek mentioned of every director and areas of thinking uh, critically about uh, what, uh, what's in the pipeline uh, but the recommendation also critically includes the need to continue to look at other areas 
because the big unknown in all of this is how long, how much longer um, will these closures remain, and especially also what is the reality going to look like once they're able to open. Um, I think um, if we draw parallels to uh, the Great Recession, which I would argue is a good parallel, uh, the revenues for every casino around the country went down significantly, and it took a while to, um, for those markets to, uh, to come back up. So I know licensees are already looking at um, a diminished, uh, uh, in, in some way, uh, diminished uh, um, activity, whatever, whatever, um, whatever the normalcy looks like when they're able to open. Thank you. If we could get then, um, before we move on to any more general questions, or you know, as, as you mentioned, you had one more point, if we could um, address um, Derek's proposal. Are there particular questions right now? Um, I'll allow you to jump in so I don't put anyone on the spot. Commissioners, I do have uh, some questions, but I'll defer first to you folks. Commissioner, okay, Commissioner Cameron, are you Yes. Ready? Yes, <laughs> yes, that's a tell, like correct? In, Commissioner. That's, that's a tell. Um, you know, I appreciate uh, how much went into this. I did um, speak to CFO Lennon at length about this, which was very, very helpful uh, without having a financial background. And I thought his, uh, his and his team's rationale was really sound. They had thought through every issue um, around these cuts, and they all made they all made sense to me. So I'm just uh, I don't have any specific questions now uh, because I did have that uh, very thorough uh, briefing, and um, I, I do uh, the questions I asked were process. What about this? What happened? What would happen if this? And his his rationale was really sound. And um, I agree with his recommendation. I'll just start with that, uh, unless I hear something else from my fellow commissioners. But as of right now, I thought his rationale was sound and, um, and prudent for us to be looking at these issues uh, at this time. So thank you. OK, Commissioner Stebbins, I see you. I don't see Commissioner O'Brien right now on my, my um, laptop. So I'll, I'll go to Commissioner Stebbins. Um, sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, uh, I've also had the opportunity to spend some time with uh, uh, Director Lennon on his numbers and his recommendations. Um, somewhat understanding that, you know, when cuts we make um, impact others, but uh, I think it's still a prudent and reasonable approach for us to take at this time and understand that, uh, you know, this might be uh, some of the, the easier items for us to consider and that uh, there might be uh, more to come, but I uh, certainly appreciate the recommendations that he's put on the table at this point. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I want to also thank um, uh, CFO Lennon and I'm Commissioner Zuniga for all the work and everyone in that group that they did. I, benefited greatly from uh, the meetings that we had about this. Uh, I asked a couple questions along the way, and I think um, circling in the same area, Derek, the one point of clarification I still have that I'm looking for is the, the caveat of recommending that we do the payments monthly while they're closed, but then revert back to getting payment in full for the assessment if they're open. Is there a time frame between them is it when we when they would potentially be able to open and or when they actually open their doors? I mean, is there some sort of a, a thought on what the time frame would be that they would then have to shift to do payment and fall on the balance? Yes, yeah, so I was recommending monthly throughout the entire period. It's just if we had to move forward and then we had to resume things like T passes or parking, you wouldn't get the full 700,000 reduction for that month of June, because we'd have to reinstate some of those things. There'd be people would be traveling. Um, so we would come back and say, based on this, and we may need some overtime, so we may grab some of that money back and say, now that your doors are gonna be open, revenue will start flowing in, You've been your, you're not under that cash crunch when no revenue is coming in. We would look to 
um, maybe not get back that full assessment, but still on a monthly basis. And I think that I think that we're going to be taking that up on FY21 too, looking at cash flow and maybe helping on a monthly basis if it's if it's prudent and if their situations continue to um, be strapped for cash to um, come to a recommendation for that for the first few months of FY21 too. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, Derek, I do have one specific uh, request for a clarification on page two of your six page memo. Um, the subtotal for 1.27 million makes a great deal of sense to me. I think I've gotten clarification on those individual items. Um, I understand too that with respect to the $5 million assessment that's required by statute, the only relief we'll give to the licensees is to make it the balance of 1.25 or whatever, um, a monthly payment rather than requesting it all up front now. Um, and I see you nodding your head, so that I got that right, it sounds like. What I don't, um, what I really want not only to appreciate from my perspective, but also uh, so that the public is, it understands clearly what the $250,000 um, cost mitigation is for the Public Health Trust Fund. Um, I appreciate that right now that it looks like those funds are, um, um, are to be used for um, purposes that are unique to our mission. Um, those are not, that $250,000 is not part of the full assessment, correct? That's correct. That's funded under the Public Health Trust Fund. Um, the, the operations of our research and responsible gaming budget, while we are billing licensees $5 million, as a, to put towards a public health trust fund, their actual expenditures for the year anticipated to be 6.5 million. So we would still have to build the full 5 million just to meet their needs, plus get some from the public health trust fund. So um, 250,000 and, and, and Enrique jump in, that does not mean that, does that mean that the licensees are going to be realizing um, that gain, or does it just mean that we won't be spending that amount for those purposes? And so for Secretary Sutter's, um, under the Public Health Trust Fund, uh, the section of the of 23K that applies to the uh, Public Health Trust Fund, the discretion lies with her with respect to those expenditures. So that those funds remain available or uh, Amrike, help me out. In other words, we're not taking from the Public Health Trust Fund. Uh, it, it goes to the second. The, the second you started with um, an either or. It's it's the latter. Mm -hmm. um, as in, this is not a cash benefit necessarily for the licensees. It's a programmatic reduction, which we think is important given all the circumstances around us. In general, there was. Um, a conference that we were going to fund for the Mass Council. There's great question as to whether that conference uh, uh, slated for early June, I believe, or late May, is going to take place anyway. And if so, what shape was that going to be in terms of attendance? So we de we we deciding we're deciding to, of course, you know, eliminate those costs given the circumstances. Um, what, as, as Derek mentioned, because we are spending six and a half million, at least initially from the year, and, and assessing five million, um, you know, we are uh, we're just really uh, a net positive taking from the uh, Public Health Trust Fund to fund the operations. But it's important to note what you mentioned about at the end, uh, let me correct you if I may, on, on the last piece of your comment, which is, the remaining, because it's a trust fund, it remains within the trust fund and it operates as we continue to operate under the MOU between the BPH and, and ourselves on those expenditures. I have um, had a, a discussion with uh, Lindsay Tucker, our, our partner at DPH, who's a designee. Um, we were going to have a budget setting uh, meeting that was uh, postponed. Um, because of all the recent uh, circumstances. 
And uh, there is at least a, uh, an understanding that we'll have to rethink our budget priorities as everybody is doing, uh, given the circumstances around us. There are many things that will uh, continue to operate, but, uh, but it is possible that um, uh, within the state, within the secretary, within DPH, um, public health um, priorities will change for the, for the future uh, year or fiscal year, and we're just gonna have to have those discussions. Right, thank you. I wanted to make sure that, that, um, that folks understood that those dollars remain in the fund and that we just are basically saying we, even though under the MOU had agreed uh, that they would be spent a certain way, we're taking those spending, that those operational expenditures off table, the dollars remain in there and they'll get the full uh, benefit of the $5 million assessment. Right. By the way, I should mention, um, Though that fund um, is uh, is funded through um, you know the assessment, but also the gaming taxes, which will be you know greatly diminished from the initial revenue projection. So it's only um, incumbent upon us to continue to think about programmatically again with EPH uh, as those changing um, uh, changing conditions. Um, you know, I think the uh, bottom line message is I didn't want that to be misinterpreted that somehow we were uh, making cuts or, or spending uh, cuts somehow that would impact the dollars available to a pub to public health because um, that would that would be an incorrect assumption. Mm -hmm. So there, right. it's um, and Enrique again, thank you for uh, chairing uh, that executive committee that is per an MOU that was in place when I came on and, and Lindsay's work has been so important too and it's a great partnership so thank you. Uh, that was one point I really um, I really wanted to just get clarification for the record um, Enrique and Derek and um, I also understand that we, we are going to spread this amount over three terms if for some reason we decided that this cost mitigation operated against our core mission in a way that we had not foreseen. Would we be able to make an adjustment for the next assessment? Um, as I understand that these um, expenditures are not earmarked, our, our dollars are, are fluid and could maybe be transferred to cover perhaps a, a cost that is core to our mission. Would we be able to look at that come next month yes yes i do anticipate these conversations to be um, at least monthly um, and continue updating but you know as licensees um, pay the assessments how we're doing whether there are issues that we need to come back and revise uh, you know the one person i forgot to talk about and how involved she's been has been karen um, as well as you Chair. i mean these conversations are are very much a daily occurrence. Um, so as our situation changes and as a new need comes up or as we someone calls and says, hey, we can't move forward on this, I see these as regular updates. We've committed to talking to our licensees um, every seven to 10 days to figure out how they're doing um, because their situation can change almost daily. Um, so, you know, I do, I yes, the answer to your question, yes. And I, um, I think you'll be seeing more of me than you'd like to over the next couple months. Never, never more than we'd like. Um, so that's really helpful. That gives um, me some level of comfort that by doing this, not all up front, uh, but over the course of uh, the three months, as your proposal suggests, that that gives, again, uh, flexibility that we might need to tap. Um, Enrique, before I go on, uh, uh, do you have, do you want to address your point that you wanted to say? Um, yeah, no, just um, just a couple of uh, a couple of points. Let me start with um, something that is not in the memo, but uh, I may have alluded to, or it may be in, in our in our minds, uh, which is we are currently not making, um, you know, Derek is not making recommendations, and neither am I, on modifying existing contracts. Um, ultimately, this is something we we would have to first determine as a commission that uh, the revenues would not be uh, matching uh, what our 
um, commitments are in order to take that action, uh, which we can do as per the contract, uh, the Commonwealth contract uh, terms and conditions we could do with our existing vendors. In, in, in lieu of that, uh, because we don't want to get to that point, part of the recommendation that I want to highlight is to have those conversations and continue exploring um, you know, what we may be able to accomplish given the changed circumstances around us. Um, that's not necessarily anything that's within the memo. It's just something that as long as this, um, so long as this closure continues, is something that eventually we will have to contemplate. It's, it's just something that I wanted to mention as, as the reality around us. I don't know, by mentioning it, by the way, it doesn't make it any sooner or any easier uh, or any later. It's just something that, um, that I think we all need to uh, understand and appreciate. Um, Thank you. Enrique, you also, I, I know that um, it was important to you and to me that, um, and I'm sure the other commissioners too, they, I just haven't had been privy to their conversations, of course, under the open meeting law restrictions, um, that we revisit the licensees after they had made their requests about what cost mitigation steps or measures we could take. Um, you know, we are putting on the table a pretty big number. Um, I'm sensitive to the fact that um, employees uh, in the casino industry have been furloughed. Um, I, and I think you had a very helpful discussion with them, uh, the licensees, in terms of, you know, with our good faith uh, measures that uh, Derek has so, um, and team, including Karen, of course, have um, really outlined for us, they also are receptive to, um, to receiving those in good faith. I don't know if you want to elaborate at all, on, um, you know, without, of course, I know it was a very high level conversation. Yeah, I, I mean, the, on, the only thing that I would, I would add is that there are, um, uh, as, as anybody can imagine, uh, the three licensees are looking at all of their spending priorities and their cash availability. And um, so far, so good. Uh, but, you know, things can change, uh, uh, you know, in different ways. Um, and we're just going to have to continue monitoring uh, that situation, having those conversations, um, a one-on-one -on -one per licensee, and uh, we'll report back as, as necessary. I think for now, for today, the recommendation is very, uh, is very solid. Um, there are two elements that I will maybe uh, highlight here, which is one of cash flow, uh, and that's very prudent. That assumes that, you know, uh, it's a bit more uh, work at times uh, for the finance team to build and reconcile monthly as opposed to quarterly, but that's a easy enough thing for us to do and, and um, or straightforward rather. And, and I think it's, it's, it's a reasonable, very reasonable re request. Um, I think um, um, other things in terms of programmatic decreases, um, not acting on some of the open positions and vacancies that we have is also very prudent given the circumstances uh, and that has a net cash benefit uh, and we'll just um, you know revisit those when when uh, as time progresses we I, I get a I have a feeling that uh, a, a lot of that will happen uh, organically as we continue to operate uh, even within these circumstances. Further questions for Commissioner Zuniga or for Derek and team? Doug, Agnes, thank you so much. I can't see you right now, um, the way that our, our, our screen is working. Hi, Commissioner O'Brien. Do you have any questions or comments? I don't, no, thank you. I think you're, when you shifted in your seat, you- oh, I unmuted up. myself. <laughs> then you popped up on my screen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm not hearing uh, Commissioner Stebbins, just to check in with you and Commissioner Cameron. Are you all set right now? No I'm questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent. Uh, I want to commend uh, CFAO Lennon and his team uh, for their seasoned financial expertise. I am. Um, I asked Derek to give me his bio recently because we were having a um, a conversation with a, a legislator who was interested in, in getting updated from us. And, and, and I knew of Derek's extensive background in state finance um, and, and was happy to have see it in, on paper. Uh, we are very fortunate because he 
has um, had such an extensive and lengthy tenure in state government that um, he is able to enter this very uncertain uh, time, the fiscal time, never mind the public health crisis, um, with confidence and um, with insights that um, you know really are invaluable. And he has an equally invaluable and thoughtful team. Um, you have been nimble and you've provided the commissioner with a preliminary assessment here despite this environment of uncertainty and unknowns. And um, I appreciate that you will continue to make yourself available in a nimble fashion, monthly and of course probably daily <laughs> basis uh, to help us continue to assess um, these matters as they change so rapidly. <clears throat> so thank you. With thank that you. said, uh, we do need a, a vote today. Uh, do I have a motion? Uh, I'll be happy. I'll be happy to do that, even though I don't have it in front of me. And people and uh, our staff um, was very kind to draft the draft them. But um, I will just move that uh, the commission adopt the recommendations uh, outlined in the memorandum from uh, CFAO Lennon and, and as included in the packet and take the steps necessary to effectuate uh, those recommendations. I think that's perfect. I second that. Thank you, Barry. Any other further questions or edits to the motion? Uh, I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Your votes yes, five zero, and again, Thank you from all of us. Everybody on your team, stay well. Thank you. Uh, it is 11.37. Does anybody need to have a break before we move on to item number five? All right, I'm looking particularly at Commissioner Zuniga, so we're good. Um, moving on to item number five, um, research and responsible gaming. We do have an external guest joining us, but I'll have Mark Vanderlinden uh, set this um, the stage for this presentation, Director of Research and Responsible Gaming. Thank you. Great. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. This is the first time that I've joined remotely to the public meeting, so excuse my, uh, my disorganization. Um, I am uh, pleased to bring to you today the uh, Lottery and Revenue MGM Springfield. It's a, an analysis of statewide, it's a local and statewide analysis of the impact of MGM Springfield on lottery revenue. Um, our presenter today is Dr. Mark Nichols. Um, he is a professor of economics in the College of Business at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, and has been a member of the Sigma research team uh, since the beginning. Um, his research is focused on a variety of topics, including a comparative analysis of gambling regulation across various jurisdictions, the competitive consequences of expanded casino gambling and lottery, casino gambling and crime, casino gambling and public finance, and the analysis of casino gambling as a tool of economic development, obviously bringing uh, to this specific project, a wealth of, of knowledge, experience, and, um, and talent. Um, why is this, this uh, particular study important? Um, lottery revenue provides a significant benefit to Massachusetts communities in the form of local aid, which is why the, legis when, why the legislature issued a clear mandate to the, uh, Mass or to the Massachusetts Gaming Commission when um, it adopted the Expanded Gaming Act to require measures to protect the lottery. Taking this directive seriously, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission included in our research agenda a study examining what are the possible impacts of Massachusetts uh, casinos on state lottery. Um, the study presented today is a first of an ongoing look at lottery sales since the MGM Springfield opened. Um, it provides a different sort of look and um, has different results than the study that we've uh, presented before looking at what is the impact of lottery sales um, uh, when we open Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, what Dr. Nichols will, will uh, 
uh, present to you and provide in greater detail as well as an analysis is that lottery sales were, were down um, in Springfield the year, the first year of operation of, of MGM Springfield um, and remained relatively unchanged in the uh, um, surrounding communities. But at the same time, uh, lottery sales were up overall statewide by around 6%. Um, it's an interesting finding, and I think that um, Dr. Nichols will be able to provide some, some context and some insight into why that may be. Um, and uh, so I won't go into any further detail as to, to what his findings were. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and turn turn the presentation over to uh, Mark Nichols. So thanks for joining us from uh, Reno, Mark. And, uh, Mark, can I just interject just one thing? Uh, just a reminder, again, this research was completed prior to the suspension of the um, operations. And, and, and while we're reflecting on this, the findings are going to be relevant to the um, gaming landscape ahead. I think we should remember that the research will be critical to our ability to assess and inform policy um, reflecting the rapidly uh, changing environment. So we have to have a little bit of a different lens when we hear from Dr. Nichols because of the changing landscape, but it certainly will be critical to the, the your mission ahead, Mark. Correct? Yeah, it, if I may just to, uh, expand on that, um, Chair. I think this is in incredibly important. Massachusetts is the only state um, that has taken the research component of, of understanding casino impacts um, as seriously as, as this. And I think that the use of data, using data to inform our policy moving forward so that, that um, it, can be, um, it can be a real tool to infor inform how we do business is, is incredibly important. Thank, thank you for allowing me to jump in. And now Dr. Nichols, correct? Uh, will he be sharing the document, Do you, or will you be sharing the document? Yes, I will be sharing the document. Can, every, yeah. can everybody hear me? Good morning, or in very early morning for you. It, it, is, it, is, it is, but that's quite all right. Uh, so thank you, Mark, for that very nice introduction, and, and good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. It's, it's a real pleasure to uh, present to you today, and I will try to present my screen here to you so and share it with you. Okay, everybody can see it then? Yes. Yeah, yes. All right, well, thank you. And it is, uh, again, it's a real pleasure to, to present to you today. And the objective and purpose that I'd like to accomplish today is to describe sales trends and changes in lottery, both statewide and local, and local being in particular Springfield, as well as Springfield's designated surrounding communities. And Mark alluded to this a little bit already, but why do these lottery changes, uh, changes in lottery sales matter? First of all, the statewide context is important because lottery sales statewide are the largest source of local aid for communities. So the statewide impact is important. And MGM is important to look at as well because it was the first resort style casino to open in Massachusetts. So we might expect different economic impacts from that compared to say the slot parlor that exists at Plain Ridge Park. That said, the impacts on lottery revenue are more likely to be enhanced or more pronounced in the local area surrounding the community. So that's why we want to look at the local communities more closely. And if you look at sales trends in lottery statewide, they've generally grown relatively slowly. These are the um, this is fiscal year data. So these are the approximate times when the casinos have opened. And the general pattern here, with the exception of fiscal year 2017, is that sales have grown and they've grown relatively rapidly. You can see that in a little bit more detail here. And in particular, in fiscal year 2018 and fiscal year 2019, lottery sales grew at nearly 4%. And as we'll see in a little bit, uh, that's more than double the historical average, which is about one and a half percent over this year. And as well, lottery sales are very, very volatile from year to year. So the percentage change in any one year 
can be pretty pronounced. Uh, these large, this large decrease is, of course, the Great Recession. Uh, obviously, now we're in a very new environment, and as uh, Commissioner Zaniga mentioned, it, it's in many ways very comparable to the Great Recession. So we'll see what happens in fiscal years 2020 and 2021. But lottery sales are relatively volatile, which is important to keep in mind. But when you look at these numbers, uh, it, it's pretty safe to say that there does not seem to be any sort of impact statewide from casinos on lottery revenue. Lottery revenues have been growing and reaching record highs. Lottery profit has been reaching record highs as well. Turning now to a more local analysis in particular, and I'm sure this map is redundant for most of you, but we'll be looking at Springfield and the surrounding communities. And to provide you some historical context first, if we look historically at sales trends in Springfield and in the surrounding communities relative to the state, they've tracked each other very, very, very closely. So these communities in the past have grown at very similar rates. One thing to point out is there's some rapid growth in the state, which is the blue line here, more recent, whereas sales in Springfield and the surrounding communities seem to be flattening a little bit. You can really see the similarity historically here. So again, historically, the state has grown, uh, state lottery revenues have grown at about one and a half percent over the years 2004 to 2018, which again, I think provides some good context for that 4% growth that we've seen in the last two fiscal years, 2018 and 2019. Springfield, which is here in green, is practically identical historically to the state as a whole, as are most of the other surrounding communities. The one exception is Wilbraham, and pardon me if I didn't pronounce that correctly, uh, well, it's a very small community, and the percentage increase there is, is notably large. Because it is a small community, the lottery sales are relatively volatile, and this percentage actually hinges upon a few years where they have very, very, very rapid growth of double-digit rates. We're not quite sure why they had that um, rapid growth, but they did. So just from a historical perspective, Lottery revenue in Springfield and the state have grown very, very, very similarly, as have the surrounding communities. As probably everybody knows, MGM Springfield opened August 24th, 2018. And so the purpose of this study really is to take an early look, to look at the first year of operation and ask the question, what happened to lottery revenues? And so we'll compare kind of before and after, the year before was the year after, comparing Springfield and the surrounding communities with the state as a whole. And as uh, Mark, Vender Mark Vendelin, excuse me, already referenced, um, their paths really diverged. So during the first year of operation of MGM Springfield, the state did very, very well. Uh, lottery revenues increased at a rate of six and a half percent. In contrast, Springfield decreased by 3%. And the surrounding communities also decreased, although at a much less of a rate, uh, roughly at about four tenths uh, of a percent. So while historically lottery revenues tracked each other fairly closely, during the first year of operation, they seem to have diverged uh, from that historical pattern. And you can see that here as well. Again, here is the state average when we, we break it down by individual community. The state average, this is again the first uh, calendar year after the, the, the casino opened. The state revenue grew at 6.5%. Again, here's Springfield at, at 3%. Not every surrounding community experienced declines in lottery revenues. Some actually saw increases in lottery revenues. But all of them, again with the exception of Wilbraham, performed worse than the state as a whole. And again, I, I would not put too much into this or read too much into Wilbraham's numbers. It's, uh, again, it, it, their, their revenue is very, very volatile year from year, in, in part because it is a very small community. So the natural question when you see something like that is, are these changes related to the casino? And 
I hate to give the typical economist the answer, but we really can't kind of say right now. Uh, first of all, we only have one year of data, so it's a little premature to conclude anything based on one year of data. Uh, remember, lottery revenues vary a lot from year to year, so obviously it's, it's difficult to say that there's a trend based on one year of data. And as I'll show you here in a minute, there is some evidence that part of that decline may actually be more of a return to normal lottery sales or the historical trend in Springfield. Lottery sales in the year prior to um, MGM opening were unusually high for Springfield. So the decline may reflect some just return to, to a longer term trend. And you can kind of see that here. So these are biweekly lottery sales in Springfield from the period of June 2014 to August of 2019. And a couple of things I think that, that stand out to me in this. One, lottery sales have been relatively flat. And if you recall from that um, earlier picture I showed that they've been lottery sales in Springfield and the surrounding communities seem to be kind of flattening out in recent times. And this reflects that. So there's really very little upward trend here. Secondly, if we look at lottery sales prior to MGM Springfield opening, which is at this time period right here, you can see over this time period, lottery sales actually reached a peak. And they were declining, lottery sales were declining even prior to the opening of the MGM casino. And again, this is a little bit like reading the tea leaves perhaps, but there, there does not seem to be at least visually any clear break in lottery revenues after the MGM casino opened. These sales, at least to my eye, uh, look very, very, very similar to the historical level. And you can kind of get a context, uh, another context as well, if we look at MGM, uh, excuse me, if we look at Springfield, the surrounding communities and the state as a whole, the year before, the year after, uh, these, these are just indexed to make these numbers comparable and it's all relative to the month prior to opening. Springfield is the green line and you can see that this is that peak that we saw earlier. So this is that peak right there, which has occurred in March and April of 2018. I believe there was a large Powerball jackpot. So you saw lottery revenues in all communities in, in, in the state as a whole increasing during that time. But they increased more rapidly in Springfield. And if you just look at sort of the, the, the pattern here, you can see that the growth rate in lottery sales in Springfield and in the surrounding communities prior to the casino opening exceeded the state. And then after the casino opened, which is right here, you can see the growth rate in the state as a whole is now above those lines or is faster than in Springfield and the surrounding communities. So Springfield and the surrounding communities were doing relatively well with lottery sales prior to the casino opening. So that 3% drop may be just a little bit of a reduction coming down from, from that peak. What do we conclude from all of this? Um, the good news is, is that there really is no evidence that casinos have harmed lottery sales statewide. Uh, but when we look at Springfield in particular, we see a bit of a divergence from their historical uh, pattern where they followed each other relatively closely and lottery, sale gro lottery sales growth followed each other relatively closely. Uh, Springfield decreased 3%. The rest of the state increased 6.5%. To give you an idea, uh, Mark Vanderlinden mentioned that this was different than the experience that Plainville had. In Plainville, the lottery revenue has, has not decreased, it, uh, but it grew more slowly. And so if we exclude sales from uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino, after the opening of that, lottery sales in Plainville increased about 2% whereas in the rest of the state, they increased at about 5%. And, and just for some context, if we exclude the lottery agent that exists in the MGM casino, uh, lottery sales in Springfield would have decreased a little bit more. They would have decreased at uh, four and a quarter percent. 
And so, but again, primarily with one year of data, it's a little premature to say anything. And there also is some evidence, at least preliminarily, that the decrease in lottery sales may be a return to normalcy for Springfield. And then another point that I think is really important to make is even though lottery revenue in Springfield decreased by 3%, that does not mean that local aid in Springfield decreases. Those two are not directly connected. Local aid to communities is a function of statewide lottery revenue. It is not tied to the performance of lottery sales or casino revenue for that matter in the particular community itself. So just because lottery sales decreased in Springfield does not mean that local aid dollars are gonna decrease in Springfield. Um, all that said, we really do think that this actually warrants future monitoring. Uh, in many ways, uh, the, the results from Springfield are, are, are interesting uh, because there does seem to be something, something here that, uh, that stands out. But we don't want to make any kind of false conclusions yet or assign any kind of causality uh, to the casino as a re for this decrease in sales. But we do think it deserves future attention as more data comes in, we'll be able to distinguish whether this is a beginning of a decline in sales. Obviously, it's gonna be noisy now that lottery sales are probably down anyways. Uh, obviously, casino revenues are down, down or, or zero now. Um, but as additional data comes in, we can hopefully distinguish between sort of a longer term uh, casino-induced impact versus just normal year-to-year -year variation or, or a return to uh, normal sales levels in Springfield. And as well, we're doing patron surveys at the casino, which I'll, I'll say I, I've been studying casinos for nearly 25 years now, and to have the kind of data that Sigma has is very, very, very unusual. And the patron surveys allow us to ask people questions such as, you know, how much did they spend at the casino? but more importantly, what they would have spent that money on. And the lottery is one of those choices. So we can find out that people would have spent um, money on the lottery as opposed to the casino. So that was fast and brief, hopefully, but uh, I, I'll thank you and, and just uh, take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. Questions from my fellow commissioners. Zunica, you're leaning in. Yeah, that's my sign. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Mark, uh, Mark, and Mark and Mark, let's say. Um, uh, one, uh, one piece of feedback that I remember from um, the lottery director, um, prior lottery directors, uh, is uh, this notion that there is some variability in terms of the number of lottery agents at any given time. Um, I don't know if, if he explains uh, things like uh, Wilbraham, um, but I wonder to what degree um, might, we, might you be observing that yet or would need to be considered for future? So we did observe that in, in, the, uh, in the actual lottery report, and I, I don't have these numbers right off the top of my head. We also did look at changes in the number of lottery agents. So we looked at how many lottery agents opened the year after the casino opened versus how many closed. And there was turnover, um, but it was not quite, it might've been like 60% closed, but 40% open. So, I, I mean, there was, and again, I don't have the, I apologize, I don't have the exact numbers right off the top of my head, Enrique, but there was definitely turnover in the number of agents. There always is. Um, that was one reason we were a little reluctant to perhaps, make a uh, link, direct link with the casino for this decrease because if, if there were some sort of substantial decrease in demand for lottery in Springfield, we would have expected to see you know, more agents closing and very few agents um, opening. And, and moreover, we would have expected to see widespread decrease in revenue amongst agents. And, and by no means was, uh, I think a majority of agents did experience a decrease in revenue, but, but it wasn't a large majority. Many agents actually saw increases in their revenue as well. 
And just to clarify, when you speak about agents, uh, that's a term of art that's used for the lottery. It's really the convenience stores that you go in and you buy your, your tickets or the gas stations and uh, the outlets for so that small businesses that gain, gain a commission on each ticket. That, that is correct, yeah. And, I, and maybe lottery vendors would be a better name. Yeah, they do use agents. So Enrique is using the right nomenclature, but uh, we use gaming agents in a different way. So yeah, right. verification, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think table one on page 18 of the report, Enrique, is some of the stats you were looking for in terms of the agent turnover. Mm -hmm. I just happened to pull it up when I was scanning. Thank you. Question. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. About, yeah, the one thing about the lottery that is so fabulous, that makes it so successful is the uh, number of agents and the saturation um, across the Commonwealth. And I think you've raised an interesting point, Amrika. I'm not sure if, if maybe around the area of Springfield there is less stability that, that might actually contribute. When I worked at the lottery, I didn't remember hearing um, that there were um, affected community, communities that were more affected by normal turnover than others. I think that's a very interesting question. Commissioners, uh, Cameron, are you? you have a yes, uh, Dr. Nichols, you somewhat answered my question, which was, do you look at those large national jackpots that do greatly influence um, tickets, the spikes? And, and you mentioned that it, just before the casino opened, there was a couple of, or maybe multiple large um, uh, jackpot pots which do influence the sale. So it, it, you are looking at that was my question. Yes, that's correct. Great, thanks. Yeah, those spikes that go up, usually if you looked at the month, it was a, a, uh, some jackpot that was not getting hit. So the sales, the sales finally, it gets, it's always an interesting psychology. It's finally so many millions of dollars that now they'll actually play. Um, Hundreds of billions, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know why it hits a certain amount, but I think that explains at least the really big spikes because it's on a monthly increment, right, uh, Dr. Nichols? That yes, is it is. Yeah, we actually have weekly data, so you you can see those spikes yeah. very very clearly, and we actually have the breakdown by game, so I can I can see what what particular game was responsible for that increase. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. It is that alone is an interesting trend to see. Think about how the lottery um, must, you know, project its work. So, other questions for Dr. Nichols? Um, I think it'll be yep. fascinating. Oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, Commissioner Stebbins. No, sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I uh, first of all, Dr. Nichols, thanks for your report, and 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 Mark Vanderlyn as well. Um, and I think one of the questions you answered was the commission, uh, question Commissioner Zuniga had. But I also found it interesting in your report, if, if folks have a chance to go back and look at it, that you actually broke down lottery sales by zip code within the city of Springfield and that there were some parts of the city that actually did well while others um, uh, saw a downturn in sales. And it seemed to me that some of the neighborhoods immediately surrounding the casino might have seen a bigger sl uh, slip in sales than some of the neighborhoods on the on the outskirts of uh, of the casino area, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, there is definitely neighborhoods around there that decreased, but I believe the one that is directly adjacent to the casino as well experienced an increase. Uh, that is something we definitely want to keep an eye on. Um, that said, we looked at the change in sales for agents by distance and, and the correlation between a lottery agents or a lottery vendor's distance from the casino and its change in sales was practically zero. So um, it is maybe natural to expect the biggest de declines to occur immediately surrounding a casino, but uh, when we look at the, the correlation between lottery sales and their uh, distance from the casino, there was very little correlation there at all. It was practically zero. But that's something that we plan to watch in the future and to see which neighborhoods might be experiencing declines versus increases. Okay, my, my, my second question was, um, despite uh, the significant growth that the lottery had, that 6.5% increase, do you have a sense of 
how many other communities across Massachusetts saw uh, a downturn in sales, or did everybody experience kind of a uh, an uptick to reflect that six and a half percent increase? That's a good question that I don't have the answer to. Um, I'll actually make a note of that. That would be something to consider, but I, I don't know what percentage of the communities experienced increases versus decreases. I'm sorry. No, no worries. Um, yeah, and just a, a comment, you know, these are these are obviously, as the chair just pointed out, small business operators. And when people aren't stopping in for lottery sales, they're not stopping in to pick up that gallon of milk or some of the other things they purchase at some of these um, smaller markets. So it's certainly something I'm, I, I know we want to keep a focus on. But thank you for your good work. No, thank you. Yeah, and to segue on that, that was going to be my uh, comment or observation. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I think it's very interesting and, and encouraging that you're saying that we have data available that will allow you to do some really nuanced questioning around uh, the, the use of disposable income and whether uh, they opt to do use their those dollars for gambling at the casino versus lottery play. I, I think that, that if you have the capacity to interview customers going forward in light of our changing landscape, that might be very, very helpful research. I'm not the expert on that, so I, I'll leave it to Director Vanderlinden on, on that, but um, where, the, where we are facing a likely recession um, coupled with changes in social behavioral norms, it will be an interesting, um, it'll be interesting to see how um, one, if there is that kind of disposable income available, and then the extent of it, and then choices that are being made. So um, I'm glad that it sounds as though you're, that we've positioned researchers <clears throat> well to access important data. Yeah, well, this, go ahead, Mark. Sorry. I was going to say it's almost as if we um, are establishing a new baseline um, with, with the presence of COVID um, and being able to take a look at what does what does recovery look like after after COVID and and um, how does it change people's behaviors. Um, there are two other studies that are that have already been fielded um, are and are in the pipeline. One, as uh, Dr. Davis mentioned, is the patron survey, um, interviewing patrons as they, as they leave the, uh, the casino and getting a better understanding of how they're spending their dollars. Um, another is um, uh, about a year after um, MGM Springfield opened, there was a follow-up uh, general population survey for um, Springfield and the surrounding community to really take a closer look at um, in the general population of adults in that area, um, what does their gambling behavior look like compared to before the uh, casino opened up? Another way in which we can triangulate this data in order to get a, a, a much better, clearer picture. Excellent, excellent. Well, before we let uh, Dr. Nichols go, I just want to acknowledge um, Treasurer uh, Goldberg and her team and of course, Executive Director Mike Sweeney of the Lottery. I understand that this report was, uh, has been shared with uh, Executive Director Sweeney in advance and that uh, the communication channels have been open. Uh, we want to acknowledge their successful um, work. You know, it's a world-class lottery. And I know right now they are um, assessing very much the impact on sales that are so critical to local aid. So we have them in our thoughts. We hope they're all safe. And um, we wish their work well. So thank you. And Dr. Nichols, uh, uh, very nice to meet you uh, virtually. <clears throat> Likewise, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you. you. Now we're moving on. Of course, I flipped my agenda, folks. Um, sorry. Um, let me just get back. We are on item number is it six now, uh, Bruce? Yes, yes it is, the qualifiers. Thank you, yes, we're going into the um, reports from um, Loretta on the two qualifiers. Um, Loretta, please, enforcement. Yes, good afternoon, Chair uh, and Commissioners. Uh, good afternoon. We, good afternoon. Um, 
Uh, the two qualifiers for your consideration today are Mr. Atif Rafiq, who was a qualifier for MGM Springfield, and Mr. Rajiv Rai, a qualifier for Encore Boston Harbor. Each of them submitted all the forms required and complied with all of the IEB's requests for supplemental and updated information. The IEB completed its protocol for suitability of casino qualifiers, and we confirmed financial stability and integrity, reviewed litigation history, searched criminal history, verified that no prohibited political contributions were made in Massachusetts, and conducted checks of open source and law enforcement databases. I do want to acknowledge the investigative team involved here, which was comprised of troopers Tom Rogers and John Morris and financial investigators Monica Chang and Susan LaRosa. Uh, the two qualifiers were able to be interviewed in person, uh, Mr. Rafiq in January and Mr. Rai in February. And as we would expect, they were cooperative and forthcoming in all aspects of the investigation. Turning first to Mr. Rafiq, he joined MGM Resorts International in May of last year as the president of commercial growth for the company. He was hired to lead growth strategy for the company and he's responsible for overseeing a number of critical functions, including marketing, revenue, distribution, IT, analytics, and internet gaming and sports betting. Mr. Rafiq reports directly to MGM CEO, Mr. William Hornbuckle, and he is based out of Las Vegas. Previously, he worked for Yahoo Inc. from 2008 to 2010 as general manager overseeing engineering, marketing, and finance. He then went to Amazon.com from 2011 to 2013 as a general manager who focused on the development of Kindle direct publishing. From 2013 to 2016, he was at McDonald's Corporation as its chief digital officer. And then before joining MGM, he was at Volvo Cars from 2017 to 2019 as its chief digital officer and global chief information officer leading strategic initiatives around business model changes for that company. Mr. Rafiq is currently undergoing a full background review by gaming regulators in New Jersey, and New Jersey has qualified him under their temporary process. Our background review confirmed that he completed his undergraduate studies at Wesleyan University and went on to receive an MBA at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Mr. Rafiq has demonstrated to the IEB by clear and convincing evidence that he's suitable, and the IEB recommends that the commission vote to find him suitable uh, after reviewing uh, the report that you have uh, to find him suitable as a qualifier for MGM Springfield. And I'm not sure if you wanna take a vote uh, now on, on you do do it by individual, or if you'd like me to proceed um, uh, with Mr. Rice. Uh, let's do I, let's do them individual basis so we can ask any questions for um, yes. for a, a, a chief enforcement counsel deputy director Lilios. Questions? Um, I'll just go through. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins, any questions for Loretta? Stebbins, Commissioner Stebbins. And, oh, no, you, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, Commissioner Zuniga. No, thank you. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, no questions, very clean investigation. And, uh, Commissioner O'Brien? Uh, no questions, thank you. Uh, Loretta, I'm gonna just uh, note one, one item um, because it caught my eye, because I'm, I'm always interested in, in national real estate um, markets. I'm not sure, if my notes say that maybe on page 10, there's, um, it looks like perhaps that Mr. Rafiki um, indicated a substantially, reported a substantially less amount for his home. And then, in, I think it's just a typo. It says 400,000. And I'm wondering if you want to just look at that after the fact, if it was supposed to be 
because the ultimate, I don't want to say out loud, the ultimate number was substantially different. Um, yes, it actually is, is not a typo. Uh, ultimately, um, uh, there uh, was a, a material difference in amount reported uh, and um, uh, the verified uh, amount, uh, but th that is not uh, unusual based on information that uh, was at his disposal and a conclusion um, was reached that uh, there was no uh, in intentionality um, oh. uh, with any kind of representation. Uh, so uh, there was a difference, the verified amount uh, was reviewed and acknowledged uh, and by him. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, oh, that's interesting. I understand that every market is, is very different and in and, and the market. And I think that was Nevada. Perhaps it was, maybe it wasn't Nevada, but in any case, um, I was just curious. So thanks for the clarification. Sure. So Madam okay, go ahead. Nope. Madam Chair, I move that the commission find Mr. Atif Rafiq, president of commercial growth for MGM Resorts International, suitable, suitable as a qualifier for Blue Tarp Redevelopment LLC. Excellent. Thank you. Second that motion. Thank you. I'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Um, and the chair votes yes. All set. Five zero. Moving on to the next qualifier report. Yes. Around, thank please. you. So turning uh, turning to Mr. Rajiv Rai. He is the Chief Information Officer, North America, for Wynn Resorts Limited, the parent company of Encore Boston Harbor. He attended the Birla Institute of Technology and Science in India, where he received what he described as the equivalent of an undergraduate degree in management with a focus on information systems. At Wynn Resorts, Mr. Rai has three main responsibilities as Chief Information Officer. First, to ensure that all infrastructure and systems function efficiently to serve and support the businesses. Second, to ensure that all information, data, and systems are secure. And third, to continuously identify new systems and capabilities. He also is based in Las Vegas and he reports directly to Mr. Billings, uh, Craig Billings, President, CFO, and Treasurer of Wind Resorts Limited. Prior to joining Wynn in 2018, Mr. Rye was a senior manager at Ernst & Young from 1998 to 2004. He was an enterprise architect at Best Buy for a period in 2004. He was the business capability lead at Accenture from 2004 to 2010, with Accenture being a Fortune Global 500 professional services company. He then returned to Best Buy from 2010 to 2012 as Senior Director of IT. And before joining uh, the Wynn Company, he was Chief Technology Officer at the Neiman Marcus Group from 2012 to 2018. He is licensed in good standing with the Nevada Gaming Control Board and is in the process of applying in New Jersey and Indiana for sports betting purposes. Uh, similarly, Mr. Rye has demonstrated by clear and convincing evidence to the IEB his suitability under our criteria, and we recommend that the commission vote to find him suitable as a qualifier for the Encore Boston Harbor license. Commissioner, is there any question for Loretta? I see you all right now. Okay, everyone is shaking their head no. So barring no questions or comments, except excellent work by your team. I know I'm speaking for all of us. Um, do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move the commission find Rajiv Rai, Chief Information Officer, North America, suitable as a qualifier for WinMass LLC. Second. Thank you. Um, roll call, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. All set with Chair, yes, 5-0. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Loretta, for and your team for excellent. I'm glad that we're taking care of that business. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, moving on to item um, AA, which uh, we did amend the agenda yesterday because this came to our attention um, unexpectedly. We wanted to be. Just, uh, amended our agenda, 
And now we'll be hearing from uh, uh, Director Griffin, please. Uh, good morning, um, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I believe I am joined by Crystal Howard. I don't see her up, um, but if she could just let me know. Crystal, there she is. There she is, okay, great. She'll just make sure to unmute herself by toggling down or on her phone, if she's on the phone. There she is, oh, she's good. unmuted. Okay, great. All right, so I'm gonna present a brief background and um, turn it over to Crystal. So uh, we are presenting an amendment request for a 2019 uh, Workforce Community Mitigation Fund grant that was approved by the commission last year. Um, Springfield Technical Community College runs an adult education program called Hamden Prep as a sub-grantee of Holyoke Community College. They offer reading, math, computer literacy, and access to um, certificates like the Culinary Serve Safe Certificate. Um, and I'm going to um, now just turn it over to Crystal to describe this specific request. And, and my apologies, I did, um, I recognize I, I accidentally um, went uh, around our legal division presentation, so I caught you off guard. I'm sure that the, the legal division is all right for a few more minutes, and, and I appreciate uh, that I, I skipped down. So anxious, yeah. to hear, uh, anxious to hear this good report. Thank you. Thank you, legal division. <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon, commissioners. Um, good afternoon. So, this specific request uh, is to kind of be able to allow the Hamden Prep program at Schenectady, or sorry, Springfield Technically, Technical Community College. I'm from Schenectady, so that's funny that slipped in. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, to enable them to switch from um, their in-person courses to be able to move to a digital model, uh, as well as the need to be able to purchase technology in order to do so. So they are specifically requesting that they uh, spend approximately $62 to $6,500 on two Zoom Pro accounts, 15 Chromebooks for um, the students and 15 hotspots as well, so that they can switch to this new learning model. Originally, this program was supposed to, uh, their, this cohort was supposed to run on March 30th, but they've extended it to begin on April 13th so that they to get their instructors and advisors ready to move to this model of the program um, and get the students on board so uh, they can have a orientation with uh, some of this technology and the new syllabus and, and just to get them situated for the new, uh, new way that this will work. Um, I think that, oh, so I, I also just wanted to add that the, they do not intend to ask for additional funding and they won't be uh, needing to really revise their budget all that much. They're intending on using rollover funding that was originally allocated to be able to do additional in-person classes, which cannot happen at this time because of uh, the situation with COVID. Crystal, excellent well, job on your memorandum. Thank you. Questions from my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, no, no questions. I think it's uh, commendable that uh, Springfield Community College is being so nimble and there will be, with our approval, be able to uh, accommodate students in, in a new fashion. Excellent. Commissioner O'Brien, any questions or comments? No, it's very straightforward. I think a really smart move to be able to keep moving forward. Excellent, thank you. And Commissioner Zunica? No, just to agree with the recommendation and I'm glad that they're able to um, to be nimble as Commissioner Cameron mentions and, and react to the circumstances. Excellent, and Commissioner Stebbins? No, I, I agree. I appreciate the fact they're being nimble. They're using uh, reallocated funds and uh, the fact that the workforce training can continue despite the fact that the uh, the campus itself is is closed down. Um, Madam Chair, I'd move that the commission approve Springfield Technical Technical Community College's request 
to move to a new digital learning model and to allow for the purchase of necessary technology, including Chromebooks and hotspots to support it. A second. second. Thank you, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. And the chair votes yes. Excellent work, Jill and Crystal. They reached out to you and you were able to pivot so quickly. This was done um, really very quickly. And I appreciate the commissioners being able to catch up. And um, of course, even Marianne was amending the, the uh, agenda with the good help of our communications team. So it takes a village. Appreciate yeah, it. We, we thank you as well um, for getting it on the agenda so quickly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It needed to be timely, so um, you know we appreciate that uh, you're available and receptive to our external stakeholders. So thank you. All right, now uh, my apologies to uh, to uh, interim general counsel Claude, um, Grossman. I do have the agenda in front of me; just my eye went right right over number seven. So we do have an emergency reg to consider. Todd, are you available? I am. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. We're certainly accustomed to doing regulations at the end of the agenda, so this was uh, <laughs> perfectly anticipated. Uh, I was excited uh, not to be last, but <laughs> sorry to today. It actually was <laughs> on my mind. I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I'm joking, of course. But anyway, this uh, is an issue of the moment, and uh, I'd like to offer just a quick background, if I may, if that would be helpful as to the proposal before you. You'll recall that by statute, a casino patron has one year in which to claim gaming-related winnings or prizes. Um, and this seems to be of the greatest relevance and come up most commonly in the context of slot machine winnings via possession of the so-called Tito tickets. With the temporary closure of the casinos, patrons in possession of winnings that are coming up on the one-year date and set to expire are left without any ability to cash those winnings. So the proposed regulation uh, amendment before you today is designed to remedy this issue. Uh, this issue is governed by statute in the first instance though, it's covered by chapter 23K section 53, which provides that unclaimed cash and prizes shall be retained by the gaming licensee for the person entitled to the cash or prize for one year after the game in which the cash or prize was won. If no claim is made for the cash or prize within one year, the cash or equivalent cash value of the prize shall be deposited into the gaming revenue fund. And so while we can't change or grant a variance from the one year statutory provision, the commission can interpret or add clarity to the statute. So for example, the commission can't just say that everyone has 18 months instead of one year to claim a prize. But the commission has clarified and added some direction to the statutory language uh, of section 53 via its regulations. And that's contained in 205 CMR 138.68. There, the commission has addressed the application and administration of section 53 by doing such things as requiring a monthly report and remittance of funds to the commission and allowing for things like comps uh, by the licensees. So the proposed language uh, that you have before you uh, here today would be an amendment to 138.68, it's paragraphs uh, 1A and 1B. And as you can see from the draft in the packet, we would add the language in red, which provides that in calculating the one year period referenced herein, and in MGL chapter 23K section 53, any period of time for which the gaming establishment was not in operation shall be excluded. So basically all we're doing uh, with this proposal, should it be uh, adopted, would be to uh, amend the manner in which the one year period is calculated, not changing the period of time that is uh, set by statute. Um, I also, I would just add one quick point because this has come up before too. This applies solely to the gaming winnings and not racing. Racing winnings uh, or unclaimed winnings or which we know are referred to as outs are actually covered by a different uh, section of uh, statute that's in chapter 128A 
And the calculation there is not actually impacted by these temporary closures um, and is handled separately. Um, given the immediacy of the issue, we are proposing emergency adoption of this regulation so we can get it into effect immediately. Uh, but we'll then immediately take action to move this uh, proposal through the formal promulgation process, including the customary hearing and uh, opportunity to comment and what have you. And of course, you also have before you the associated small business impact statement uh, for your consideration. So with that, um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to address those. Otherwise, uh, that was the overview I wanted to present. Commissioners, questions for Todd? Um, I can't see Commissioner Zunica right now, but I can see the others. Do you have any questions? No, no questions from me. Um, there you are, thank you. Okay. I, I don't have any questions, just comment that it's a pretty standard process to toll or freeze sort of calculation of days in the legal system if you can't actually execute, which it seems with the closure, this seems like an absolutely logical approach to take. That, that's right. And we did go over, um, at least in my presentation, with Claude, whether procedurally this will be difficult for uh, the licensees to calculate, I think um, it was Bruce Banz who said he doesn't expect it to be any impact. And going forward, let's you know imagine perhaps there's a water break or something in one right. casino. This would give, um, if they were out for a week, some kind of a, a re, um, pre for the patrons. It really right. serves the patrons' interest. And it's our understanding, Todd, that the licensees all welcome this, this uh, regulation. That, that's my understanding as well. A couple have actually offered some comment and support. Um, so uh, obviously this will also go out for wider public comment should there be any technical reason why it's not uh, going to work properly that we can modify. Excellent. Okay, um, um, I think we would want to uh, have a motion with respect to the small business impact statement first uh, for a vote if there is unless there are other questions for Todd Madam madam chair I move the Commission approve the small business impact statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 136.68 expiration of gaming related obligations owed to patrons payment to the gaming revenue fund as included in fact second Commissioner O'Brien, thank you. Um, barring any further comments, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Chair votes yes, 5-0. Moving on to the regulation and emergency adoption procedure. Uh, Madam Chair, I further move that the Commission approve the version of the amendments to 205 CMR 136.68, expiration of gaming-related obligations owed to patrons, payment to the Gaming Revenue Fund, as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process by emergency. Um, I would second just with a clarification, it's 138.68. Correct. Thank you. Barring any comments, all those in favor, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And Chair votes yes. Excellent work, Todd. Thank you so much. Uh, and we understand that that will go, you'll go uh, forward and we'll revisit this on the, in the more traditional fashion. Thank you. Before we um, close, uh, the agenda did not include um, a, a place um, keeper for commissioner's reports. And I know, uh, Commissioner Stebbins, you wanted to give an update, and I'd like to allow you to do so. Uh, sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is just uh, really just two quick uh, acknowledgments. Um, first of all, the, the commission uh, wanted to reflect on the um, uh, retirement or stepping down of Jill McCarthy Payne, who has been a member of our local community mitigation action committee uh, for region B. 
Uh, Jill was a representative for the city of Springfield. She had been a member since 2014 and had been chair, uh, regional chair since 2016. So we thank her for her service. I'm sure at some point when we're all back together, we can send her an appropriate certificate of appreciation. Uh, but uh, I enjoyed the chance to work with Jill, as I know uh, Mary and Joe Delaney did as well, uh, and we'll miss her leadership. Um, secondly, I want to acknowledge somebody that was also um, a critical component of the, uh, the Region B, uh, LICMAC, and that was uh, Tim Brennan. Tim was uh, the executive director of the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Uh, he was uh, executive director for 38 years um, and retired at the end of 2019 um, from, the, from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Uh, he was a champion for the Valley and its quality of life. Um, uh, prior to his retirement, we know that Tim played a very active role with the hosts and surrounding communities to offer them services uh, an evaluation of proposals during the application period uh, and we greatly appreciated his leadership. Um, sadly, um, Tim passed away on March 13th, just as this crisis uh, that we're experiencing was uh, beginning to take hold. Uh, so on behalf of the commission, I, we want to extend our prayers and condolences to Tim's family and thank him for his service. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Stebbins. And I'm very sorry for that uh, report. Uh, we thank Jill for her service and we'll have her in our thoughts and prayers. Other um, from other commissioners, this is an opportunity for you to report on, on anything that you'd like to report on at this time. No opportunity going forward, of course, to Commissioner Zaga. Yes, uh, Madam Chair. I. Um, I should have mentioned this as part of the budget uh, discussion, but I'll mention it now. It was implicit in the memo, but I wanted to call it out. Uh, you remember that um, you designated me, you and my fellow commissioners, as um, the point person for the search for the procurement of the search firm for the um, uh, executive director. And we, um, we received responses um, but we, given the, really during this um, period of closure, um, and my uh, uh, recommendation is uh, um, that we hold off on evaluating those responses and at least temporarily um, suspend the procurement, um, you know, notify that uh, the respondents in, in combis, as, as is always our ability to do, um, until further notice. Um, as, um, I mentioned it's implicit in the memo because uh, one the recommendations that we uh, approved relative to the budget modifications were those pooled positions uh, summarized in, um, uh, in Derek's memo. And that of course is also the, includes the, the salary of the executive director. So um, I don't know if that required to be uh, notified um, I, I'm, um, I'm just mentioning that uh, by way of update. Uh, I just figured it was uh, prudent given the circumstances around us to at least temporarily uh, pause that uh, procurement. Any questions for Commissioner Zinga on that? No. Thank you for that update. Commissioner Cameron, do you have any update you'd like? Bye. Just a short update, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I continue to work during this pandemic with uh, a group of very thoughtful regulators and advisors from around the world on the international joint conference with uh, IMGL and IAGR, scheduled at this point to be held here in Boston. We are the host agency the third week in September, but um, this group is very thoughtful and is monitoring what is happening around the world, um, peaks at different times. Uh, so there may be uh, you know, some changes. Um, we don't quite know at this time, but I, I do want you to know that we're 
they're asking for our input and it's very important to the group about what is happening here in Boston. So I am impressed with the thoughtfulness of uh, the two different groups as well as the um, what's happening with gaming around the world, those reports. Uh, so I'll have more for you um, at, a, at a later meeting, I'm sure, but we are continuing to meet and, and monitor at the same time. Thank you, thank you. Commissioner O'Brien? I don't have any updates at this time, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm all set, so um, again, just uh, to our entire team, um, MGC, you know, this um, virus is getting closer and more personal for, for certain members of our team. So we will keep all of you in our thoughts. Um, we all appreciate everyone doing their civic duty, really, which is to stay home and stay safe. And we are all um, very, very appreciative of the fact that we are a strong, strong, um, collaborative and, and kind and appreciative team. So thank you, um, stay safe, and uh, I'll take a motion. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Commissioner. Second. Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. The vote chairs, the, the chair votes yes, thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you.